Hello and welcome to this lunchtime seminar from the Society of Underwater Technology. It's my turn today. My name is Sue John and this is me, for those who don't know me. Um, I'm a member of, um, of Council, Chair of the Education Committee, and I've been involved with the Society for about 15 years. As you can see, I'm also a liveryman of the Worshipful Company of Scientific Instrument Makers. My, education, uh, my background is in education and science communication. Um, my spe specialism is the history of technology and the role that technology plays in helping us to understand the world around us and how we use the underwater technology that's available. Today, I'm going to explore how robots are adding to our knowledge of the ocean and how they are used by researchers. The role of robots have gradually changed over the years because of their low cost manufacture. Therefore, they are no longer just used in the oil and gas industries. So here we go. Here's a robot, 1950s style, from an article in Life magazine. The US Air Force thought it'd be great to have a machine this big to pick up an egg. But I suppose it, um, it shows how, how that um, arm works. But what we have to also think about, that this is the 1950s. And those of us of a certain age, um, this always reminds me of Robbie the Robot. And of course, we're in the golden age of science fiction and in the initial stages of the Cold War. But because of miniaturization of circuits and of circuit boards and sensors, this enabled robots to become smaller. And here are a few examples. Robots now are regarded as the satellites of the underwater world because they are now our eyes and ears for the underwater world. And here we have a couple of big and small. This always reminds me of them. Um, a Star Trek version, and this is uh, an image that Steve Hall got at one of his uh, conferences. But of course, they have to be deployed. But with both types of satellites, they do have their deployment risks, and many hearts are being broken at this point when in flames, and of course, when in bubbles. The satellites of the underwater world carry out so many different roles, including search and rescue operations, making them an absolutely essential piece of the kit. So today I'm going to talk about three projects, one from the University of Queensland of Technology, the Schmidt Institute, and a NOAA-funded project published in The Conversation. So here we are. This is the Great Barrier Reef. So of course, if you're going to talk about Queensland, you're bound to be talking about the Great Barrier Reef. And this, came, this project came to my notice about 18 months ago when I, sh I was shown a piece of equipment that could be carried by one person, deployed and tethered off a floating rib in the cr crystal clear waters of, off the Queensland coast. So here's the reef. Um, in a view from the International Space Station. And it always reminds me of a jumbled mass of fossilized bones. You can see the spines, the ribs and the tails. And if you look very, very closely, you can see some fingers or, um, or, or claws. And it obviously is a beautiful part, part of the world. And this is the project. Excuse me. It's called the Cot Spot. And these are the two gentlemen who thought of this wonderful piece of equipment. And it's developed in conjunction with the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. And this project evolved over a couple of years to solve, to, it's designed specifically to solve a particular pest problem. And those of you who know the Great Barrier Reef, you probably know what what pest I'm talking about. It's obviously 
the crown of thorn starfish. This can eat up to 10 square meters a year of coral and grow up to a meter in diameter. And there came a point of time um, by the reef rangers in the marine park that there were too many starfish and not enough divers to cover all the hotspots uh, along the reef. So to eradicate this pest and working with the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, they came up with these, this idea. And as I said, it was designed and developed specifically for the need to help the marine rangers to eradicate the thing. It acted as a first responder where each robot delivered up to 200 lethal injections of bisalts directly into the starfish in situ on the reef working night and day, three times longer as a human diver or as long as the battery lasted. And probably in Australian waters, where sometimes it can be dangerous for a human diver. Here is Matthew to explain further. Just get this video started. And here we go. Hi, I'm Dr. Matt Dunbabin, Principal Research Fellow in Autonomous Systems. At QUT, we've developed an underwater robot with advanced technologies to help protect one of the world's greatest natural wonders. The problem that we're trying to solve. The Great Barrier Reef is under enormous pressure from Crown of Thorn starfish. Controlling their numbers is a massive task. That's why our team has developed the Cotspot. So Cotspot is an autonomous underwater vehicle. It has its own brain and eyes, and essentially you can see the seafloor and onboard process the images to determine where Crown of Thorn starfish are, and then its onboard control system will actually allow it to inject the starfish. Great Barrier Reef is a huge economical drawcard for Queensland and Australia. Crown of Thorns starfish are a naturally occurring starfish, but they eat coral. This is a big problem for the Great Barrier Reef, and it's going to have a big impact on our tourism industry, also our fisheries industry. Yeah, here it is. Okay, can inject now? Injecting. Yeah. yeah, this whole project is what we call transdisciplinary research. It involves a number of stakeholders with different backgrounds from computer science to electrical engineering to marine science. What's what's unique in that it's the, one of the only robots in the world that uses computer vision to actually control a pest. Uh, samples from different sizes, different viewpoints, different colours. I have a passion for the environment and how we can protect it. QT's research is for the real world. We are solving big problems we face now and into the future. Cotspot works in one of the most dynamic and challenging environments. By integrating the latest in robotic technologies, we have shown our platform to be accurate and adaptable. We see Cotspot in related technology as the future of marine environmental monitoring and management. I think you agree that's quite a bit, bit of work. So over a period of time, trials and testing and everything else, they came up with this. It's a collaboration, uh, again, with the Great Barrier Reef as well. But where did the money come from for the Cotspot to morph into Rangerbot? The project received a, boost, a funding boost of 750,000 Australian dollars when it won the Google Impact Challenge People's Choice Prize in 2016. But it continued to win, win prizes as well. Let me just see this one. This is... Um, Anna Marsden, the Great Barrier Reef Foundation Managing Director, and this was in August 2018, when they won um, the Out of the Box, Out of the Blue Box Innovation Challenge, which is supported by the Tiffany & Co Foundation. So they continue to win prizes, and slowly the money and the reputation builds up. 
I'll leave you with that for, for one moment. And the lady on the, the right, that's Anna Marsden. And here, they, they win another prize, the Key UT and Design Works Good Design Awards. Uh, it was the 61st Good Design Award for Sustainability in Australia. Um, the electronics was built, uh, was designed by the two academics, that, the engineers that you've seen already. And I suspect that the other three men are from Designs Works who, who built, who designed the flotation system and the casings, probably that's why it looks so swish. As Professor Dumbabin says, is that it was a winning collaboration of Queenslanders. And so knowing a great many Queenslanders are very, very proud to be Queenslanders. And this is something that the teamwork built, something unique, that this particular design allows the robot to be continually adapted and easily changed to do the job that it needs to do. Look at that picture, they're not at all pleased to win this award, are they? And I bet a few beers were sunk that night as well. So if we go back and have a look at the Ranger Bot, as you can see, it weighs uh, 15 kilos, it's 75 centimeters long, controlled through a smart tablet. And if you look very carefully, they hold they use the smart tablet sealed in a little sunny bag. Um, so very practical. It can, it can go in the back of a pickup or, uh, or a um, back of a car and can be deployed off a rib. So that means they can go into shallow water directly onto the reef. It has low manufacturing costs, making it easy to churn out with different attachments and sensors, it can monitor the level of coral bleaching, water quality, pollution, and the buildup of the silt on the reef itself. So to demonstrate the flexibility of the Ranger Bot, working with Professor, Professor Peter Harrison of the Southern Cross University, the Ranger Bot was called upon to deposit live embryos directly onto the reef. It has been found through trial programs that when live embryos have been deposited onto the reef, gradually can rejuvenate itself. And if I find the slide, if I go on a bit, just excuse me, here we are. Um, and it now starts acting as a midwife. Let me just start this for you. I think you can agree with me that that is a real great bit, great piece of kit, and I would love to see it in action. So we have a quote again from uh, Anna Marsden, and the Ranger Bot has the potential to revolutionise the way we manage our oceans, and is an important tool to have at our disposal in the quest to save coral reefs. So we're not really talking about just the Great Barrier Reef, where there are loads of people. Um, a loads of money in the economy to go in, in the tourist industry along that stretch of the Queensland coast. But it also means that it can go to other places as well. So if it can be tested here in this environment, it can go out and do other reefs. 
But this particular place is an asset to our planet. It is over, it is home to over 600 species of hard and soft corals. And so that image there, I took myself in a helicopter flying over the Great Barrier Reef. I know I shouldn't fly over a but it was really absolutely fantastic. So we go on to our next project. And um, we've looked at how a rob robot uh, with simple mechanical changes can work as a conservationist. Now we're going to go to the other side of the Pacific um, with the Schmidt Ocean In Institute to explore the North Pacific subtrop per kilfant by using a series of robots. If successful, it would be the first time that by using various vehicles, it will come up with a better way of mapping a large area of ocean. So here we have the RV Falker. And if you look very carefully, there's a little orange line and that's the drone. I'm sure you agree with me that the Schmidt Ocean Institute has a worldwide reputation for excellence in oceanographic research. The expedition I'm now going to talk about is an, again an absolute gem. This expedition demonstrates the use of an array of scientists working with an array of ocean observing vehicles to find, follow and sample features of the North Pacific subtropical front. Now a front is an area of open ocean that is very complex and has many similarities of two weather fronts meeting. But only in this instance, it, uh, where a mass of warm water meets a cold current. And this particular front is off the, uh, the coast of Southern California, um, directly in a line with Los Angeles. Um, so using only satellite data is usually not enough to track this massive lump of constantly changing water. The usual method of exploring this is for a research vessel to crisscross an area where they think it is and the team to carry up what I call a dip sample and test um, along uh, lines where, the sea, um, where they think that the two bits of water meet. So here's the team that are doing this work. A bit out of sync there. So here's the team. There's the gliders, the drones, and the, the people that, and in amongst there, apparently there's an anthropologist as well, which is quite interesting. Um, so when we get to, let me just go back. Um, so when, just before the RV Falker got on station, uh, the lead investigator decided, and this was in the plan, to, um, uh, because they're using a variety of surface, subsurface and aerial robots and drones, uh, they decided to set out a wave glider and two sail drones ahead of the uh, arrival of station on, on the, of the research vessel and the other members of the team. So those of you who have got teenagers stuck in a darkened room playing on their Xbox or whatever computer game they got, look how it is controlled. And my husband with his game and his mobile phone. So just look how that is controlled. So he's looking pretty cool there with his glasses, his hat on and his Pringle sweater as well. So there we have the drone taken off. And so the, the, their jobs were to locate the front well in advance of the vessel and to send back data to the support vessel where on board was an AI system and they, were, they altered, they refined it even more so that they handed over complete control of these things, except the controller who flowed those drums, to the robots. And I think this is where the anthropologist comes in of how we interact with bits of metal, bits of plastic and a whole pile of um, wiring. And so, um, in fact, 
the Falco was working really as a, a floating controls vehicle um, for all this kit. But all the, using all these um, different robots, AUVs, um, and different bits of equipment, all this meant that the work was completed quicker and the area was meticulously mapped. So here is um, a, a wrap-up, Schmidt's wrap-up video to tell you a lot more about it. Um, if you, if I ask Steve, maybe that we can put these um, links onto our website for you to have a look at on your own. Um, here's the video. And in here, we have quite unexpectedly, I didn't know this, this gentleman was here, um, one of our SUT members, Leighton Molly. There's a particular thrill that comes with accomplishing something that is hard. We've spent the last several months, almost year, putting together specific technology just for this expedition. We've come out here to the middle of the Pacific to put our ideas to the test. And to be out here seeing it work so well feels really good. It is really rewarding to work with this team of scientists who've been pouring their knowledge into building these vehicles. So not only are these high technology, they also contain the intelligence of the scientists we're working with. You put them in the water and they execute algorithms and missions based on these scientists' thinking. Typically, it's very difficult to basically operate multiple assets, especially in the open ocean. Our AUVs did over 1,000 nautical miles. Some of them operated for over 200 hours. We had operations where we had at least three AUVs in the water non-stop for approximately five days. I think that the most important thing there is to develop the capability to have a sustained presence in the ocean. The Falcor was collecting data, the wet lab was using the water coming in from the Falcor, the AUVs were measuring the water underneath, and the UAV was measuring the water from above. And we sent them all in the same direction over the same part of the front, and we collected all this data over a really wide area all at the same time. As biologists, uh, we are really dependent on this technology to understand at high resolution the distribution of ocean organisms. This is very important to identify the biological hotspots in the ocean uh, for future conservation efforts. Since the ocean is in constant change, we need these tools to collect data for a longer period so we can make informed decisions to better understand the ocean and the environment around it. We as engineers, we solve all types of problems, but without an application to our technology, it doesn't have much of an impact. What we're doing here in collaboration with ocean scientists is really rewarding because it does have an impact. I think it's essential for humankind to understand the big picture because in the end we are talking about the life support system for the Earth. Let's just stop that there. I think you can agree with me that that is an absolute gem. I, d I just love that, that project because it has women saying that they're engineers. And I was amazed at how many of the engineers were women. And I just thought that was absolutely great to be a role model. And, to, and she was directing them. She was directing the biologists and she was in amongst everybody else telling or solving these problems. That's what engineers do. They solve problems. So now we come to my final item, and I hope I haven't caused the PowerPoint curtains to fall across your eyes that you've been interested in these things, because I, I just think they're absolutely great. Um, so far, I have highlighted successful projects. 
And in this last part, I'm going to talk about an article I came across in the conversation. Um, this publication, I think is really good during this time of lockdown where maybe our concentration levels aren't up to what they should be or what they were. Um, they have short, accurate and informative um, articles. And here for this article that I'm talking about, there is the link. Um, waiting for an undersea ro robot in Antarctica to call home. So I think you've got the gist of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and again, we come back to our interaction with technology, um, which is one of my um, areas of interest. Um, the author describes in her article that her funded programme, as with everybody else, um, hired a vessel to cruise around the Antarctic Peninsula for a month. And what they did while they were cruising around this lovely part of the world um, was measuring and estimating the amount of krill that were in the waters. And the author's job was to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> was biochemically analyse the quills tissues on board while the vessel was cruising that particular stretch of water. Therefore, her role was very much hands-on. Um, and because funding is getting really tight everywhere, um, even for NOAA, uh, who this um, lady works for, um, the funding for cruises is getting smaller while everything else, the costs, are escalating. So as a group, uh, the decision was made to do not to go on a cruise, but to hand over um, their hopes and dreams uh, and use gliders. And so, so for the people who, and there are quite a few people who just randomly look at our um, our seminars, that um, this is a glider. They're usually yellow and um, they measure between one and two meters long. Um, they're full of electronics. Um, they sometimes float on the ocean surface like this one. Um, they can dive to about 3,000 feet. Um, and once they're full of data, they bounce up, find a sat find, um, bounce onto the ocean surface, find a satellite, transmit some data um, they have on board, and then dive down again. And this is repeated many times. And ideally, the rest of the data is um, retrieved on its return when on its return when it's programmed to. Um, and that's it. Easy. What could be simpler? And so here is um, a NOAA um, glider being prepared. Um, is getting told what to do. Uh, some of the implementation is going in the sensors. And this is what it looks like when it's being prepared. So the author is going to um, hand over our work to a lump of metal and, as I said, a pile of wiring. And it's going to be thrown or dropped into the Southern Ocean. Um, this is the area, her search area. Um, it's 20,500 square miles. It's in this. Um, around the um, South Shetland Islands. Um, the Antarctic Peninsula is there marked, and as you can see, the tip of South America. Um, and this is where the two gliders were going to be um, floating around on. Um, it's not the best part of the world for one of these things to go. Um, but if there was a flawless uh, deployment in the Drake's Passage, and she said about the feeling as taking a toddler off to college on another continent, he needs you and you can't get to him. So again, we get to this attachment of a human getting attached to a glider. So there's the, there's some, but here you see his, her, sampling route. Uh, the white lines are a sampling route and this is where the glider go, um, it was going to go start and finish and slap bang in the middle there is a red oval. That is an iceberg. 
and this particular one was 12 and a half miles wide. Um, and for, again, for, for those of you who just come upon us, this is an iceberg. Looks beautiful in photographs, um, but most of the iceberg is underneath, under, below the surface of the water. It doesn't have any smooth edges. Um, it avalanches ice every now and again into the ocean. Uh, it's not smooth, as you can see on the left. It's rather rugged and it can swamp. When the ice avalanches into the ocean, it can swamp boats, any boat that is nearby, not only because of the weight of the ice that's falling, but also because it does make rather a large splash in the water and it's noisy. Uh, so there's your, there's your iceberg. So we'll go back to our sampling route. And this is where it's in the middle and two gliders are just randomly going, going along that stretch of water and of course icebergs eat um, anything along its way it doesn't matter and of course these things can easily get stuck under lumps of ice or destroyed by lumps of ice falling in it and the thing is with these gliders you don't know it stops um, you don't know that it's lost until either it stops calling home or it doesn't come back so when it was time for them to come home, the wait starts. And for this particular author, it went on and it went on and it went on. And you can, when you read the article, you can almost see the head and the hands and the very various words that are spoken or not spoken. And you can imagine it's just dreadful. Eventually for her, her wait was over after 16 hours and the glider couldn't be. So we go back to the toddler of thinking, where have you been? And that, that's it. But at last, she was able to retrieve her data and it had returned and it did call home. So in conclusion, Robots do serve a purpose in rescuing budgets and by making ocean research um, quicker, which in funding terms means it's cheaper. But what about the stuff that doesn't come home? And this is, I think, this is where Schmidt's anthropologist comes in. Our human interaction with a bit of metal and plastic, with a whole lot of wiring and sensors, carries so many hopes and dreams and of future funding. So let's return before we finish to the 1950s and Isaac Asimov's robot series. Here he is with his telltale sideburns and the three lords of robotics that he came up with in his novel in Runaround. I've only got the first one here because I thought this was the most appropriate. A robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Old Isaac didn't say anything about our nerves when they didn't come home, but then I don't think he imagined that one day robots would take to the sea. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Goodbye.